This video contains massive One Piece spoilers. Please be warned. Underneath the wacky and traditionally cartoony aesthetic of One Piece, its silly character designs and immature humor, there is a deeply political story being told about forgotten histories unmasking oppressive ideologies and most importantly, liberation. However, liberation is a nuanced subject which can be viewed from so many angles and perspectives. To some, liberation can be as simple and minimalistic as feeling free. This is something that's even showcased in the series, for instance. If you look at someone like Luffy, the character that helms the story, he chose to go out to sea and was like, well, almost immediately, I'm good. But you would be right to think that this is both a selfish and reductive interpretation of freedom. Some might even read One Piece and recently ask themselves, should this be what liberation is all about? All I'm seeing is pirates performing unlawful deeds, inconsequential violence, and monarchies being toppled left and right, only to inevitably get replaced by other monarchies, thus perpetuating systems where power accumulates under one person and no one else. As plentiful as these developments are in the story though, the liberation theme I'm talking about goes a little bit beyond. Some would say, a lot more. You might not believe me if you're not a fan or if you've never seen the show before, but this little story of a boy going out to sea and becoming Pirate King tackles pretty strong themes that connected to the real world scientific discipline appropriately titled Liberation Psychology. So when I started researching this video, I was honestly a little surprised with how few discussions on One Piece included the topic of liberation sciences. You know, I acknowledge that this can be a super niche topic, but then again, it's also one of the more successful stories out there, and it's literally about freedom. Plus, in my opinion, there's a strong thematic overlap between the two, but most I found were Reddit posts on progressive anime and manga, an article or two on social justice, and the One Piece podcast Fight Together series, which by the way, if you haven't seen yet, I highly recommend it. It's a great listen. However, unless I miss something, none of these reference liberation sciences directly, much less liberation psychology. So. What even is Psychology of Liberation, and why is it relevant to my cartoon show about pirates? Because even I, who's talking about this here with you, feel a bit weird associating One Piece with anything psychology related. For starters, One Piece is not a very psychological series. Well, before I dive in, I want to open the topic up with a trigger warning, since both the origins and purpose of liberation psychology concern real-life violence and tragedies, predominantly taking place in Latin America, but extending all over the world. Okay, so, as a whole, there are many liberation sciences. It's not just psychology. There's also theology of liberation, sociology of liberation, and all of these emerged during the second half of the 20th century, namely during the 70s and 80s in Latin America. Although places like the US and Europe began to take interest in these developments much later during the 90s. And even though these branches of science have different authors and separate backgrounds behind them, they all commonly developed as a response to oppressive political regimes and conflicts. To name a few, and this is more on the history side of things, there's the civil war in El Salvador, the dictatorships in Chile and Argentina, marginalized communities in Puerto Rico and Brazil, among many others. And they aimed to form a theory and practice devoted to liberating people who have been oppressed and put down by these violent circumstances. So due to layers and layers of historical oppression, many communities in Latin America have developed identities marked by exclusion and severe inequities, which is where these sciences come in. Imagine being born and raised somewhere where identifying as pro-independence means being branded a criminal or even being the son or daughter of someone like that automatically means you're being observed and monitored. Or even something as basic as being educated or knowing certain truths means being persecuted and possibly killed. 
If you're a One Piece fan, some of these might sound extremely familiar. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about. These are examples of experiences people in the real world have gone through and continue to go through, which end up playing a huge part in shaping their identities thoroughly, mostly through generational trauma. And there are big parallels here between the history of some of these communities that inspired liberation sciences and the One Piece story, especially with the genocide at Ohara, the incident at Egghead and God Valley, the censoring of the D-Clan, and even the Blank Century and the displacement of the Lunarians from the Red Line. So to name a few real-life events that mirror the events in the story, First of all, there's a military-driven massacre of scholars in Mexico that occurred in 1968, where governmental forces shot against students who were protesting in favor of the human rights of their peoples. There's also the Guatemalan Civil War and genocide lasting almost 40 years, where tribes were persecuted and killed. Even the gag law in Puerto Rico, which allowed the government to closely monitor people just for being suspected of being pro-independence, sometimes just for being related to someone and having their last name. However, unlike many traditional sciences that separate themselves from their subjects for the sake of objectivity, liberation sciences commit to the people, their communities, and their struggles which makes them more action-oriented than most other sciences. For instance, and this is incredibly sad, but some representatives of these disciplines have been killed while advocating for their community's needs and rights, as was the case of Ignacio Martín Baró, one of the main authors of liberation psychology, who was assassinated by the Salvadorian military in 1989. Nowadays, the principles of his research continue to guide liberation psychology as basic tenets, so in other words, things that communities should strive for to liberate themselves. And in my opinion, this is where One Piece shines regarding its portrayal of liberation because the tenets Martin Baró wrote about seem to line up well with events in the One Piece story. The first one is de-ideologization. And I know it's a long ass word. It pretty much means to unmask an alienating common sense that hides the obstacles towards democracy and equal rights. So to translate that, because it might sound very convoluted right off the bat, Martin Baró wrote about how certain political ideologies become what's considered common sense and socially accepted as logical for the majority. And this common sense of sorts keeps people from seeing the real struggles of everyday citizens. Let's use the O'Hara incident as a key example in the series, and I'll offer a bit of a summary for those who haven't read One Piece before. But basically, O'Hara was an island home to the world's largest historical library. Their residents were mostly scholars who devoted their time to uncovering the secrets of the world and its past. However, as part of their academic efforts, they attempted to decipher old scripts called poneglyphs, an act that had been forbidden by the world government. The world government then began to spread propaganda that these scholars were seeking out forbidden knowledge for malicious purposes, and as a result, a naval bombardment wiped out all of the scholars and residents, leaving only one small child as the sole survivor and this one child was then publicly demonized throughout the rest of her life. So by brandishing these academics as a threat, the world at large started regarding them as devils. Therefore, their collective identity became pretty much inseparable from evil in the public eye. And the military barely batted an eye when obeying orders was concerned, which is not unlike what happened in many places in Latin America. And liberation psychology's solutions are to, one, raise critical consciousness, so basically to deepen your knowledge about reality, two, to assume the perspective of the people, so to focus on what the people need and not what science, governments, and other institutions think is important, and then three, commit to a process of giving power so the people can determine their own existence and choose their own destiny. 
And in many ways, this is what Ohara and later Vegapunk tried to do. Again, spoilers for the One Piece manga ahead. Proceed only if you're comfortable with spoilers. But during Vegapunk's flashback, we learned that the will of Ohara lives on because the scholars chose to throw many of their books into a nearby lake with the hope that some of their knowledge would survive. When this chapter came out, many criticized this development as a retcon and a detail that undermined past tragedies in the series. However, if we look at this through the lens of liberation psychology, this is how Ohara fought back. And it makes sense that Ohara would fight back. Liberation psychology acknowledges the people's diverse manifestations of power, and even when power differentials might show up, with military power against unarmed scholars for instance, they had a power of their own and chose to use it one last time. And even though Vegapunk is later portrayed as a flawed individual, by seeking and saving this knowledge, the Oharans gave the rest of the world a chance to unmask the oppressive ideologies of the world government and liberate themselves. In my opinion, this development doesn't make Robin's flashback any less tragic. If anything, it makes it more real and deeper by having it resemble events that have actually happened. And Oda, the author of One Piece, chose to depict this knowledge as something more powerful than even Devil Fruits and Hockey are shown to be, which are the magical power systems in the story. Of course, this theme in the series doesn't end here, and we could go on for hours. I guess another miscellaneous example that might be worth mentioning is Luffy's refusal to take credit and be regarded as a hero by the communities he supported. Because that's the thing about psychology of liberation. It doesn't disregard that science or people in power have a role to play in liberating others from oppression. But they have to do it by walking alongside the people and by being mindful of both their position and their power and how that can overshadow what's really necessary. And personally, I feel like One Piece tackles this theme really well and it honestly makes it another reason why it's worth reading. And that's the video. I recognize that this was just the tip of the iceberg, but if others would like to hear more about how other facets of liberation psychology overlap with the series, I would love to tackle more videos like this in the future. Anyways, thank you again for watching. I appreciate your time and having sat through my video. And again, like, comment, and subscribe for more future content. Have an awesome day, guys.